in today's balkanized academic world where you have to concentrate in a tiny subsection of an academic discipline to get anywhere it's very interesting when you can find someone who does several things very very well and this next book is about uh, one of those people um, his name is Ernest Gellner this isn't book uh, this isn't a book by Ernest Gellner it's a book about him from the uh, political philosophy now series that um, the University of Wales Press puts out here's the cover uh, Ernest Gellner and modernity and the book is written by uh, Michael Lesnoff I apologize for the glare there um, Ernest Gellner lived from uh, 1925 to 1995 and he was a French-born Czech Englishman so he's got quite a background uh, whose interests are as varied as his uh, string of uh, ethnonyms would suggest he's he held while he was alive uh, a number of academic chairs in sociology anthropology and philosophy and he was also known for his interest in the methodological foundations of science the political culture of early Islamic society and dismantling what he considered to be the three biggest con games that have uh, taken in intellectuals in the 20th century and uh, those three would be postmodernism, Freudianism, and Marxism. His, his best known book, which is still somewhat read, is called uh, Plow, Sword, and Book, which uh, he thinks are the big three, the, the biggest three, uh, the, the three big inventions of, of civilization, ancient and modern, the plow. Uh, for obviously reasons was very important the sword and uh, lastly the book a relatively new invention actually um, this is I said it, an imprint from the University of Wales called a political philosophy now and it basically uh, takes you know one author Michael Lesner in this instance and he basically talks about Gellner's entire body of work um, Lesnoff does do a really competent job at this, even if his approach isn't nearly as witty and sharp as, as Gellner's prose notoriously was itself. His delivery is pretty flat and pretty academic, but he's very clearly familiar with Gellner's work, and especially the conversations in which Gellner was intellectually engaged. Um, I've only read a little bit of Gellner's original work, but I can only assume that his interpretation of uh, Gellner here is accurate. He is certainly not an apologist for Gellner uh, and openly criticizes him when he thinks it's necessary. I won't discuss all the topics discussed here in the book, but I thought that some, some of the work deserved uh, particular attention. Uh, the best part for me is the last chapter called uh, Relativism and Cognitive Ethics. Cognitive Ethics, as I understood it from the book, uh, is essentially Gellner's way of defining intellectual honesty and is loosely synony synonymous with the scientific standards of testability and falsifiability in the Popperian sense, uh, after Karl Popper. Uh, he accuses uh, Freudians and Marxists uh, it, of lacking this cognitive ethic because embedded in these systems are always uh, deflections of criticisms aimed at those systems. If you're not a Freudian, for example, you're simply in a state of false consciousness. Um, note the similarity to the Marxist rhetoric there. You're in denial of Freud's truth, right? Um, if you deny Marxism, you're a useful idiot for the bourgeoisie. Uh, blind to the alienating, alienating effects of capitalism. Basically, all these systems, and he goes on to critique postmodernism along the same lines, have internally co-opted all criticisms by saying, if you don't belong to us, then there must be a problem with you. The problem can't be internal, it must be external. Um, and because of that, 
Gellner says that they're unfalsifiable. Not because of that, necessarily, but they happen to all be unfalsifiable, and therefore they're necessarily unscientific. Which is a problem when many of their practitioners, I mean, especially Freud, thought of himself as doing science. Um, Marx probably thought much the same thing. And if you're doing science when, the, when your root claims are unscientific, that's probably an issue. Uh, there are also chapters on nationalism, Gellner's theory of history, which is set forward in the book that I mentioned earlier, Plow, Sword, and Book, uh, politics in modern society, and a really funny, blistering attack on the linguistic philosophy popular at Oxford during the middle of the 20th century, especially that of uh, Wittgenstein, which is found in his book Words and Things. The only chapter that I didn't find convincing was the one on Islamic society in which he seems to state that theocracies are particularly adept at conforming to modernist ideals and suggests a distinction between high and low Islam. Uh, those sound, it's especially the first sounded counterintuitive at best, but if anyone knows about Gellner's writing about Islamic society, um, if you know anything, I'm certain you know more than I do. So uh, share thoughts or comments about that down below and, and let me know what you know. Um, I thought Lesnov's book was a, a pretty good, solid, standard uh, survey of Gellner's life work. Um, I would certainly, you know, suggest this for anyone who's interested in, uh, in Gellner and just, you know, wants to, to dip their toes into the proverbial uh, pool and, and see what he's all about. Uh, Ernest Gellner and Modernity by Michael Lesnoff. Uh, 